What's going on, everybody? Zach Rosenblatt back here finally with Mike K for the latest episode of the No Huddle Show. You probably forgot the sound of our voices because it's been so long. We're apologizing for that right now. Uh, there's been some technical stuff. There's been some me being at the Super Bowl and on vacation. There's been Mike K just having a complete health meltdown, right, Mike? Yeah, that's safe to say. Falling apart, just falling apart. Yeah, I mean, you know, when your kid starts off in daycare and he's one years old and, uh, <laughs> you know, we've got my wife here who's t- getting sick and then I'm sick. And like I, like I said uh, to you off air, um, I think I had like pink eye bronchitis and like broke out in hives within a month. And before I before I had a child, I, my immune system was pretty incredible. Like I was almost never sick. And so... The mix of being up north and then having the cold weather and the weather constantly changing because it's never truly really cold in Philadelphia this this winter, which is very weird and I'm very concerned about it. Uh, Global warming, baby. Yeah, and then uh oh, we're gonna get we're gonna get tagged as one of those type of podcasts. Um, <laughs> and then uh, you know him being in daycare for like the last four months or whatever. And then I'm home all the time now because nobody needs me to be at a facility. It's, you know, it's been weird. I feel like the guy from the shining, like I'm like really, really, really like, uh, stir crazy. I should say that we are not sitting next to each other because I didn't feel like catching whatever Mike always has. So we're we're recording this remotely actually. (laughs) Yeah. So this is, we're giving this a new technology test run. Um, it's kind of like testing out Jason Peters' knee after a simple knee scope, you know? So bear with us a little bit. Yes, exactly. All right, so there, there actually is a decent amount of stuff to cover. Um, you know, there was a little stretch there. There wasn't much to talk about where it was just us speculating about who they should hire on their coaching staff. The staff is full, as I'm sure you guys all know at this point. The combine is coming up. Free agency comes pretty quickly after that. Uh, we should talk about the most newsiest the, the newsiest thing that has happened recently, and that's that the Eagles decided to release Nigel Bradham, which is hashtag as expected, as they say. Uh, they could have waited until right before free agency to, and declined his option, but they, out of a courtesy to a guy who was a, played a key part on the Super Bowl team, and by all counts, even though he did some dumb stuff in his career, he was pretty well-liked in the locker room, I think. Um, they released him now. They save, a, I think, $4.5 million. They have a dead cap hit of $5 million something and now he's free to roam the market, and the Eagles pretty desperately need to add somebody at linebacker. Right? You know, it's a discussion. You know, running back's not a discussion anymore because they have Miles Sanders, but so linebacker, it kind of feels like this is the next how he never gets a guy like this position, and maybe he – I don't think he's going to invest heavily or use a high draft pick, but they, they need to bring in somebody who can start. Not They can't – not Corey Nelson, not LJ Ford. They need to bring in somebody who can come in and start. Yeah, I agree. I think um, <clears throat> this needs to be a guy that pretty is comparable in cost to Nigel Bradham. The problem is the way the linebacker market has kind of emerged over the last couple of years, you're not going to get a guy of Bradham's level or Bradham's you know, age when he did sign here for the price that you got Nigel Bradham initially. So they're going to have to do some you know, real research into this position, how he has paid middle linebackers in the past, but they seem to feel pretty good about TJ Edwards as a run defender. I don't know if they feel good about having a two down middle linebacker. That seems kind of ridiculous to me. So I'm wondering if they see him as the long-term Sam outside linebacker. They clearly like Nathan Gary at at will. Um, And they'll have some options on the free agent market. I don't know if they're going to make anybody thrilled because I think the guy, there are two guys that you and I like. I, I would guarantee that everyone likes that I think are going to make between 12 and $14 million. And that's simply not a price that I think the Eagles are going to be willing to pay. So you have to find alternatives. Yeah. And so I, I was doing some research on linebackers the other day and generally teams that pay a lot for linebackers aren't good teams. Like, you know, spending money on linebackers, like spending money on running back now, which is, Kind of weird to say, but like I think it was 10 of the top 15 paid linebackers did not make the playoffs last year. It, I mean, it's not like a perfect stat or anything, but I, I just found that pretty interesting. So I, I, I don't imagine how he's going to change his philosophy on targeting linebackers, even if there are a couple guys in free agency that 
you know, if you were going to pay for somebody, you should do it because, you know, a guy like Corey Littleton's like 26, Joe Schobert's pretty young. Um, there's a couple of guys like we're going to get into some free agent targets. We think they should get later, but um, I just don't see them getting a guy like that unless they're taking a pay cut to come here. Yeah. I, I you know, I, I, well, not a pay cut, but probably yes. like a cut in, in interest. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. 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 Cause they're both coming off their rookie contracts. Sure. Um, <clears throat> I think it's a similar situation at corner, right? I mean, there are corner and safety. There are some names out there that would legitimately make a difference and are very, very good. That said, do the Eagles want to spend a ton of money on those guys? Um, yeah. Wide receiver, not very. It's a rough yeah. class. I they're not underwhelming. They're not overwhelming. They're just whelming. You know what I mean? So it's <laughs> like uh, it's um, this free agency <laughs> class is weird. It's like Robbie Anderson is going to get paid because there's just nobody else. Like there, it's Robbie Anderson. It's Emmanuel Sanders. It's uh, Amari Cooper if he even hits free agency, and I guess AJ Green. And those are the four guys that are going to make probably pretty good money. And I probably price themselves out of the Eagles range, I would guess. Well, my thing too is right. Like it's okay to want a speed guy, but you want a speed guy who can do multiple things. You don't want to, if you're paying, you're going to have to pay him. Yes. Right. You know, if you're, if you've got somebody like Deshaun Jackson, who was really good, not just because he was a speed guy, he could make possession catches. He could get open across the middle. He could do other things. You need a guy who can stretch the field, but you also, if you're going to pay him a significant amount of money, he needs to be able to function as a possession target as well because, you know, this team's had injuries. You know that they're going to have injuries at wide receiver this year. If they draft a guy early, maybe he takes some time to develop. It's not always an immediate guarantee that guys are going to contribute despite what happened last season with other teams. So I think... Uh, this free agency period is going to be very interesting specifically because this team does not feel like a team that's trying to rebuild. They want to get younger, but they don't want to take their eyes off the playoff prize. They've been to two, they've won two division titles in the last three years. They're only two years removed from a Super Bowl. So, um, I'm, I'm really intrigued by what Howie is planning to do. They have after the, the Bradham cut they have roughly 45 million dollars in cap space i've seen a lot of people say they've got a lot of cap space but realistically it's kind of middle of the pack everyone yeah. has cap space because you prepare going into the final year of uh, a cba to spend a lot of money because chances are the next cba will increase the salary cap it'll increase player earnings and this way you can get guys on a good deal i think that's a good segue into uh, what we should talk about next because you talked about the wide receivers and the CBA. And so I, if, if you haven't been following the CBA, there's been all this talk about all the stuff that the owners have proposed and the players have to accept. It doesn't seem like they're going to accept it right away. But the point being in how this ties to the Eagles is Alshon Jeffrey. Um, seems like there are some in the, in the media who think it's almost a foregone conclusion that they move on from him. It's probably not that simple. I think they're waiting if they were to do that, I think they're waiting for the CBA to be agreed to because without the CBA, there is no post June 1st cut. And when you do the post June 1st cut, you can split up a cap hit over two years instead of having to pay all what is like 27 million is what they would have to pay. Him yeah. They they, I, I think it, I, no team in the right. Nobody's ever done it where it's that big before like that. That's a fact. So, yeah. Um, so I think they're waiting for that. If the, if they're planning on cutting all Sean and if they do cut all Sean, it's almost entirely because they don't like the locker room fit. I think at this point, because um, that they're ta- they're still taking a pretty big bullet, uh, even with the post June first thing. So, I mean, what wh- what do you make of that whole situation? How do you think that plays out? Well, you know, a lot of people connect him to the Josina reports, and if the Eagles have much better investigators probably than anybody close to that yeah. situation. If they know that it's him or they think that it's him, then yeah, they should cut him. I mean, like uh, they, it's two years in a row. You can't just, again, we're not saying that, that it was him, but if they think it was him, uh, I think there's no question you move on from that guy. It's just not, It's not productive for your locker room. It's the antithesis of what you've tried to build in your locker room. Um, You know, Alshon Jeffries had received the benefit of the doubt the last two years because of what he did in the Super Bowl year. Uh, And he probably deserved that benefit of the doubt. But, you know, at this point, 
you need to rebuild the wide receiver room. You already have one aging veteran, Deshaun Jackson, who at this point is much more well liked externally and probably internally than Alshon. Um, and I think you know it's time to build around speed. You have your big guy that you drafted to be Alshon's eventual replacement in JJ Sega Whiteside. And he's got to work out. You can't have two lumbering big wide receivers and then a bunch of, you know, small speed guys. You need something in the middle. So I think if you move on from Alshon, you feel good about signing a guy like Robbie Anderson or, or a guy like Rashad Perryman. And then you can go in the draft and draft two guys. And then you still have Deshaun, Greg Ward and JJ. So, yeah, I mean, he's taking up a spot. He's coming off a pretty big in foot injury. And I just kind of think, like, at this point, when you want to get younger, wide receiver is the best place to do it. Yeah, it, it's it's kind of one of the more interesting stories of the offseason because the Eagles have kind of been coy with it. They never came out and outright defended Alshon and said he wasn't the guy, which is pretty telling, I think. If <laughs> I mean, they, they very easily could have just denied it, and they never did that. So... Um, and I will say all the all or nothing series for some reason, didn't even mention that whole saga, which kind of blew my mind. I'm guessing the Eagles had some say in that probably. Right. I mean, yeah, but they also didn't mention, I don't think they mentioned Alshon once. No, they, they mentioned him early when they were talking about the receivers. They had that weird nickname for them. Oh, right. Yeah. 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 He was there for six seconds. It it was mostly John Hamm talking about Alshon. It wasn't anybody else. (laughs) Well, they let John Hamm talk for like five seconds. That was like his big dialogue there. Yeah. Yeah. When Angelo Cataldi wasn't narrating it. Yeah. (laughs) Oh, boy. (laughs) I mean, I I will say I was, I did enjoy the show, but definitely had some notes. I would say. Yeah. I had, uh, yeah. You can read it. You you, you literally had notes. Yeah. You can read that. I will say, and I tweeted this. And we can stop talking about it after this. I, I thought Brandon Graham like came away as the MVP of the whole series, like <laughs> without question to me. Absolutely. I mean, yeah. it, and honestly, it, it portrayed him in a light. Like that's how he is too. Yeah, I mean, I think- that's what I'm saying. It was like cool seeing that he actually is that and not just putting out a show for the media or something, you know? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. All right. Um, another topic that's kind of like been pretty big on Eagles Twitter was uh, that the Lions are apparently – looking to trade Darius Slay again. There have been like a, what was it, Mike Clay came up with a proposal where it was a third round and Sidney Jones for Darius Slay. Yep. Um, I think we might sit on different sides of this discussion. We do. I, um, I think Darius Slay is very good, obviously. Um, and he would be an instant impact guy. I, I just personally don't think the Eagles are as close to contending as maybe they do, honestly. So, uh, I don't know if trading a third round pick for a guy that you're going to have to turn around and pay $16 million next year is the best move. Like if they traded for him, I wouldn't fault them for it. I should say, but I, I would, if I was going to spend that much money on somebody, I would do it on Byron Jones and not Darius Slay personally, or another guy that I'm going to talk about later. All right. So here's my take. So you brought up Byron Jones. Byron Jones is probably going to make $17 million. He yeah. is going to be on the open market. He's going to have leverage. Um, trading a third round pick for Darius Slay, who is 29 coming off uh, his worst season in three years, but basically because he had a hamstring injury and the defensive line of Detroit is abysmal. Um, he doesn't have a ton of leverage. He doesn't have guaranteed money on his contract. And I know a lot of people say, well, when you trade for a guy, you're going to want to extend him. So they have leverage there. Well, not really. Cause if you don't have any guaranteed money and you're terrible at the gate and you don't feel like you're a good fit in, in this defense, you're going to have a bad year and you're not going to make money on the free agent market. If you don't, you know, sign, he's at a point in his career where he needs to get as much money as possible. Um, so the Eagles would have leverage in that thing. I don't think he's going to get 16 million. I think maybe he gets 14 million. Maybe they give him a three year, $42 million contract with 30 guaranteed. Um, because to me, if you're making this move, it's a three year move. Um, you do need to extend him, but it's not something to where you have to rush to extend him or you need to extend him before a deal is made. Sidney Jones needs to change the change of scenery. Um, I, I don't think Sidney Jones is really a part of the discussion, honestly. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm just, I'm putting I know, it out I know, there. I'm just saying, but yeah, yeah now, I mean, for, his sake, for his sake, he does. Yeah. 
Now, for me, I wouldn't trade a second or a first round pick for, for Darius yeah. Slay. I would trade a third round pick in a heartbeat because third round picks to me are mid level. Like the way the draft, the, the way I break down the draft, first round should be an immediate starter or at least a long impact starter. Second round should be an immediate starter or a long impact starter. Third round, you're basically, you are really guessing. Uh, whether this per- player can go from being a role player to a star. Uh, the Eagles have, get this, projected to have six um, uh, picks between the second and fourth round. They have three fourth round picks. They have two se- third round picks and a second round pick. If they traded their first third round pick for um, Darius Slay, who cares? Like, I mean, really, like in the, in the grand scheme of things, if you want to talk about the contract, the contract is where I understand. But yeah. saying that you need to hold on to three picks when you have 10 for, uh, when you have 10 projected picks is is ludicrous to me, because here's the thing. A lot of people are going to say, you know what, they need to trade up for Henry Ruggs at 15 or at 14 because they want to avoid, uh, you know, the Broncos taking him. Well, guess what? That's going to cost you a second and third round pick. So in the grand scheme of things, trading a third round pick is not that big of an ordeal, especially for a guy who's proven, who's been to three Pro Bowls, who can actually trail uh, or, or shadow. I shouldn't say trail. Trail is probably a bad word for a cornerback, but shadow a number one wide receiver, which seems to be the thing that's really been missing from this defense. Um, I just think kind of ridiculous. Now you brought up Byron Jones and I'm not hating on Byron Jones. I think Byron Jones would be the better move because you're keeping your draft assets. That said though, he's going to have a massive market. This yeah. kid is, I, I, sh- I should have said he's not, he's not even who I would, the number one corner I would go after if I was the Eagles. Well, I'm going to talk about that guy later. Yeah. He, he is phenomenal. Yes. Uh, doesn't have a lot of turnover production, but he's an absolute perfect fit for, for his own defense. He's also a guy that if you lost Malcolm Jenkins could turn into a, to a Malcolm Jenkins style player where you use him in several different roles. I think he would be a home run if they sign him. That said, you're if you trade for Darius Slay, you're probably paying him two or three less million, and you're not committing as many years and guaranteed money to him. I also think when you look at Darius Slay, there's the playmaking aspect. He clearly has ball skills. He's in that cohabitation matrix that the Eagles like to <laughs> talk about. He played at Mississippi State with Fletcher Cox. Uh-huh. I don't think there's a voice in that locker room that they listen to much more than a guy who's already making $110 million a year or sorry, 110 million a year. Wow. That's yeah. A, that's sorry. A I mean, <laughs> it, it, there's a part in, in, uh, in, uh, hard, uh not hard knocks, but in uh, all or nothing where he's like, I don't get paid $20 million a year for nothing. Uh, <laughs> but, and I was like, wow, that's a, interesting way to put it. I know I'm going off on like a diatribe, but like to me, Darius Slay is a guy who has a connection to Jim Schwartz. He was there. I I think Jim Schwartz drafted him his rookie year. And so when you have that background and you're also coming in with a guy like Marquand Manuel, who I have heard nothing but rave reviews about his ability to relate to players Young players, but also veteran players. I, I just think it makes a lot of sense. Um, and I think, you know, it's time to rebuild that secondary. If you're going to lose Jalen Mills or Ronald Darby or both, you need to have a veteran cornerback back there. They've shown that they are not very good at identifying cornerback talent. Avante Maddox had an up and down year last year after a pretty impressive rookie season. I don't know if you can even trust him to be the starting nickel next year. There's got to be competition around everybody. They need to draft somebody and they need to sign somebody. And I think Darius Slay, if you were to trade uh, to acquire him, helps you with one spot. You know one spot is locked down. Yeah, my, my old thing, it wasn't that they shouldn't trade for him necessarily. I was just, when I tweeted about it, I was more just exploring if it's as home run of an idea as everybody seems to be presenting it. Because I think there are, and you presented some of them, there are some reasons to think they shouldn't do it too. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. Um, That's why you trade uh, a third yeah. round pick. Third round picks are basically like the, uh, you know, third round picks are essentially the dominoes 
of pizza or, or, of, or of draft picks. Like they like they serve a purpose and they can be good sometimes, especially when you're drunk. But you know, you you would prefer to have that hole in the wall New York style pizza, probably. I would assume. Yeah. Um. No, not that analogy didn't work for you. <laughs> it's been better, I would say. Uh, okay. <laughs> uh, all I right. Count um, on you that. <laughs> hey, you gotta you gotta hear my honest opinion, you know. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> all right. So I guess we can, we might as well do the our the targets thing now before we talk about the combine a little bit. Um. So we wanted to do if if we were the GM or the Eagles or whatever, who our top three targets would be. We're we're doing it in a sort of draft style, so we both can't double up. Um, I'll let you go first since you're a sick boy. Yeah, uh, <laughs> a sick boy. Yes. Um, <laughs> we're doing this. Neither one of us knows who the the person yeah, exactly. So I talked about rebuilding the secondary. If you're not trading for Darius Slay and giving him a ton of money, the guy I'm going after is Anthony Harris. Uh, he has been phenomenal for the Minnesota Vikings the last few years. The only reason why they're not going to be able to resign him is because. They have not done a very good job of managing their cap situation. Obviously, paying Kirk Cousins a bajillion dollars guaranteed didn't work out very well as far as the cap's concerned. They did win a playoff game last year. Um, If they don't get rid of Stephon Diggs to open up cap space, they're probably going to have to let Anthony Harris walk. Now, that said, Anthony Harris is a big playmaker. He makes plays on the ball. He's a guy who would be the perfect fit of free safety would be a, you know, otherworldly upgrade from a playmaking standpoint over Rodney McLeod, who I think is going to get an okay contract on the open market. He had an okay year. Um, He's also 30. I think Anthony Harris coming off five years with the Vikings is a smart move. You pick him up. He sets the tone for your secondary. The problem is, is he's probably going to get that Landon Collins money, which is about, 13 14 million dollars that's probably yeah, gonna Sp- spot track has him uh projected at 13.8 million annual salary so. yeah so that's gonna irk one malcolm jenkins and i think you're only targeting anthony harris if you feel like malcolm's probably not gonna like the deal that you're gonna give him yeah so that's gonna trigger a trade i would imagine we talked about it off the air the other day i'd imagine you can get a fourth for for malcolm I know that doesn't sound very appealing considering how good he is, uh, but he is also 32 and wants a new contract. Um, and I could see a team, an older team that feels like they can contend trying to trade for him and maybe signing him to a three-year extension. Um, that'd, that'd be pretty wild. Uh, it would be pretty wild, but I do think there are some really good strong safeties in this draft. Yeah. And I also think there's some lower end free agents that could work out in, in that way as well. But Anthony Harris is a guy who I think is a can't miss free agent. Yeah. And like you said, I think that if they were to go after a guy like that, it ties into how they feel or what they plan to do with Malcolm. I don't think you can get him and also pay and keep Malcolm is probably how it would play out. Right. Right. Yeah. I mean, well, you know, if you feel like you, you want to invest, you know, $25 yeah. million dollars in, in, in safety, safety which yeah. they historically haven't really done. Right. That sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, but this is who what we would do, so that doesn't matter anyway. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, all right, so I'll I'll stay in the secondary. The guy I've been teasing is uh, James Bradbury from the Carolina Panthers. Um, he's only twenty six years old, I believe. Um, mm-hmm. He's had a really good couple of years in Carolina. He he's going to be expensive. He's not going to be like cheap, but I think he's going to be cheaper than uh, Byron Jones. You could probably get him for twelve to fourteen mil a year, I would guess. Um, and he's just the sort of like guy they signed in 2016, like a Rodney McLeod, a uh, Nigel Bradham, um, Brandon Brooks, you know, in the 26, 27 range in the prime of their careers uh, can become better in the right scheme, I think. And I, I just think they need to be targeting guys that they can build around like that. And that, 2016, if not for the like 2016 has a case as Howie Roseman's best off season, I think I uh, 2017, he like hit a hundred, had a hundred percent hit rate. So it probably gets more credit, but in terms of like the quality of player that he added in how they stuck around long term, like if I think they need to try and have an off season like that, where you're targeting guys in their prime who maybe aren't the most expensive guys in the market. Um, that that's kind of where I would put Bradbury at the t- at, in terms of like realistic. If he even hits the market, they could franchise tag him. But if he hits the market, I would put him at the top of the list of guys they should go after. So 
if they're going to spend the money on Anthony Harris, I still think they need to address cornerback. And um, that probably takes them out of the Byron Jones, Bradbury uh, sweepstakes. So I'm going to go with Bradley Roby, who I was very impressed by playing with the Texans. Can play in zone. He can play in man. He's a guy that Howie Roseman was absolutely infatuated with when he was coming out of college uh, out of Ohio State. Um, long arms, able to make plays on the ball. He's one of those guys that you sign for like a mid-level money. He's probably going to make 10 to 12, I guess. Um, maybe he makes nine, who knows. But he he bet on himself, signed with the Texans, played well on a one-year deal. And I think he's a guy that would make a lot of sense. He fits into the, the length and the speed that um, – Schwartz desires. He's kind of got a pretty similar physical makeup to um, Sidney Jones, only he's a lot tougher, I would say, when it comes to tackling and contact. So Bradley Roby would be the corner I would target there. How old is he? He is, uh, um, I believe he's 27. Yeah, he's 20, uh, turning 28 in May. So, yeah. I mean, he, he's the age. You, he probably, he, obviously, he wouldn't be as expensive as. The Bradberries of the world. So, what, what what do you think he would make? Probably less than ten million a year, right? Uh, it's probably say ten or eleven. I mean, he's a guy who who hasn't really started a ton of games. I mean, he only started ten games this year. He was dealing with an injury. Yeah. Played well though. Um, he's only been a two year full time starter. But the, what's great about him is he has the ability to play nickel and outside. He can move around. He'd probably be your number two corner. And the the idea would be to go into the draft and handle that need probably in the first or second round. And then maybe you've got two guys that you feel like you can build around, but Savante. Yeah. Yeah. So you need, you need guys that, that can play well. I mean, he's only five eleven and 194, but he's got some decent length. Um, he has the ability to, to blitz, but he's broken up a lot of passes in his career. He, he, he's played, six seasons and broke up 68 passes. So that's an average of uh, 11 pass breakups per year. And he's only really been a starter on the outside for two years. So that that's kind of impressive to me. Yeah. I think that makes that signing that would make a lot of sense. Um, not, not if, if he's like the top guy you're getting, then people won't be too excited. But yeah, if it's like the scenario that you play out where they get a big name guy and then they sign him, I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, I'll go. I'll go linebacker. I, I like uh, Devondre Campbell from the Falcons. Yeah, I like him too. Um, he's not an inside linebacker, but, you know, as people have talked about, like the Eagles like Nate Gary a lot more than maybe the media or fan base does. So I think he's going to be their inside linebacker next year, probably. Um, and then, yeah. Uh, but they, don't, they only play one or two linebackers most times. But uh, Campbell is an outside linebacker. Um, he was really productive last year. He had over 100 tackles. He's 27, I believe. And, you know, I, like they, like I said, they need to get a guy. He's 26, actually. They need to get a guy who is who can they, could, they can keep here for a few years that they can, like a Bradham, like you said. And I think he's the closest thing to that on the free agent market. There are a couple other guys that are interesting, but since we're only picking three, I, I'm going to go with Devondre. Yeah, and he's got a background with Mark Manuel, who's his defensive coordinator yeah, for a couple yeah. of years. Yeah, application matrix. Yeah, he would he would play well here. Um, okay, so my last guy, he's not gonna make he's not gonna break the bank. I mean, we've already kind of done that with the corner and safety position. Um, obviously, you need some sort of insurance at the wide receiver position. Yeah, pro football focus and uh, Bleeding Green Nations. Mike Kiss brought up uh, Rashad Perryman, and I initially was very hesitant to look at his projected seven million dollar per year price tag. But then when I really thought about it, it makes a lot of sense. So Perryman, you might remember, was a first round pick of the Ravens, burned out after three years, then signed with the Browns and had like a nice little streak during the last couple of games of the 2018 season. Then he signed with the Bucks and went off. He he produced more than 600 receiving yards and had six touchdowns. And he was the number three wide receiver there behind, you know, Chris Godwin and, and Mike Evans, two guys who both put up thousand yard seasons and looked incredible. Um, Perryman's a guy who has, his kind of squashes drops issues. He's a guy who's got a lot of downfield speed, 
Um, he's he averaged, I think, 17 yards per catch last year, and then 21 yards per catch the year before. He's a guy who who can stretch the field. I think his best role would be in a rotation with Deshaun Jackson at that Z receiver spot. This way, you have a fail safe for Perryman if he doesn't work out or if he struggles. Then you also have a fail uh, an insurance policy for Deshaun Jackson because I think a lot of people think, wow, they need two wide receivers to start. Deshaun Jackson's going to start, so Perryman gives you the ability to have a backup for Deshaun, but he can also play in the slot and give you speed out of the slot, which they like. So Perryman and Ward can can rotate or Perryman and a draft pick can rotate inside. You're moving Perryman all around the field. And I think for one year, $7 million, it gives the Eagles a year to kind of study him, similar to what they did with Alshon Jeffrey, to see if he's a guy who can be here long term. It also gives Perryman a chance to rehab his value even further and possibly cash in on in free agency after the new CBA is around. So I think that would be a smart move. If you sign Perryman, you are drafting a wide receiver in the first or second round. Absolutely, still. That shouldn't stop you from doing that. But I think Perryman's a guy who makes a little bit of sense from a versatility and speed standpoint. And I, I should point out that uh, I was just thinking about this. In 2018, when the Eagles were having injuries at receiver, they brought him in for a workout because he was still a free agent until October. Right. Uh, and they didn't sign him then. He, I mean, he was still having drops issues back then. And he he had a crazy like last three games of the season this year with the Bucks where he had a hundred game hundred yards in each game I believe, um, like like he's just kind of like, the fact that he's such an appealing option is like a product of this free agent class. But I mean he does make a lot of sense. I'm curious how much he'd cost. Probably like a one year seven mil or something like that. I think that's what PFF had right. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um. So I was gonna do like a safety or something, but I figure I might as well have a little fun with this since this isn't actually anything <laughs> serious. Uh. So I'm going to go with Marcus Mariota. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, obviously, I don't think I actually think a backup quarterback should be one of their top targets. But uh, if he doesn't find a starting job on the market, I think it makes a lot of sense. Um, he, I mean, he's he's been a competent quarterback. He's not a star by any stretch. I think he could help rehab his image in Philadelphia. He'd be an ideal like backup for Carson Wentz for when Wentz goes down because I don't think you need to change the offense all that much with him in there. And also, it would just kind of be funny just to poke and prod Chip Kelly a little bit if they bring in the guy that he does so desperately wanted way back when. I, I just think he, out of like the guys on the free agent market, he's one of the more appealing ones to be a potential backup, depending on the cost, I guess. So to recap, uh, my guys are Anthony Harris at free safety, Bradley Roby at cornerback, and Brashad Perryman at wide receiver. And then yours yeah. are? Uh, James Bradbury, Devondre Campbell, and Marcus Mariota. So. We've spent a lot of Jeffrey Lurie's money. Um, <laughs> we want to hear from you guys. So, you know, if you sign up for Eagles Extra, make sure you uh, – the first text you send us is your thoughts on our free agency uh, situation. You can down – or you can sign up for Eagles Extra. It's in every single one of our articles on nj.com slash Eagles. Make sure you check it out. Um, we've we've built like a very great – great – community there i think uh, a lot of feedback and a lot of great uh private amas you can get feedback from us at any point in the day um we're around so make sure you sign up for eagles extra yeah for sure it's been a lot of fun uh i should say if that if i had done a safety i was going to do demarius randall by the way i just wanted to throw that out there because I, I like that his, his versatility and he played corner and he's been a pretty good playmaker in his career I've heard some uh, not so nice uh, behind the scenes things oh, about okay. him. So, <laughs> well, I didn't know that part, so yeah. that's why I didn't include him on my top three. I just wanted. Hey, to test there you go. That's all that was. It was a test. Boom. <laughs> um, all right, before we go, the combine is coming up. Um, we could do a little mini preview here. Uh, I know you've done some scouting. Before we get into like those guys, I want to ask like what what are you most interested to see like like what do you think how he's going to talk about that's going to like be the headline grabber guy last year. If you remember, he announced that the Eagles were not going to franchise tag Nick Foles, which we didn't know going in. I'm curious, like if there's going to be like news, do, what do you, what do you think he reveals to us? Well, he's, for not, a big, he's not a big revealer, but he's, he's not a big anything really uh, <laughs> from, a, from a size standpoint. Um, <laughs> oh boy. I mean, height. What do you like? What like? Don't make this a false thing. Um, <laughs> oh my god. Oh man. 
Oh boy, we're gonna get canceled. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> God willing. Um, uh, so, I mean, I think he's going to talk about Alshon Jeffrey. Like, they need to address that, and the CBA could be done by then. Um, just because the CBA is done and they're able to make a June first cut doesn't mean they have to do it immediately. Um, especially because he's injured, so it's not like he's going to get an immediate free agent, uh, you know, visit. Um, so they can kind of bide their time there. I, I wouldn't be surprised if Alshon Jeffries the talk of the combine. Another spot that I think they'll talk about probably is Josh McCown and his future with the team. Oh, good call. And, yeah, and, how, and a question I I was going to have for how he was going to. Because I, I wonder if he'd admit that they're moving on from Jason Peters. Yeah, I mean, that would like, be... Like in, a, in like a professional way. Like, the, you know how all these teams have done the press release about how they're not resigning yeah. somebody? Like, I, I feel like they have to do that with Jason Peters. See, I'm more intrigued by Doug Peterson's press conference. Oh, yeah, that's a good point with, and, in terms of that, yeah. And let me tell you why. So, obviously, there's a lot built up about Deuce Staley being turned, no, good point. turned over for the passing game coordinator. You and I both agree that he should have been considered for the offensive coordinator role. If they decided to go with passing game coordinator from the jump, I'm okay with them passing on Deuce. Here's why. They only really interviewed guys with passing backgrounds. James Urban's a former quarterback, wide receiver coach. Um, Graham Harold, offensive coordinator, former quarterback. Uh, Mike Kafka, who they didn't interview but were interested in, former quarterback now a quarterback's coach. Um, you know, they bring in Scangarello to be their senior offensive assistant. He's got a background with quarterbacks and wide receivers. Press Taylor, obviously, is a quarterback's coach. Um, if you're going to make it that position, I get it. Um, but I want to know from Doug how early in the conversation was it, hey, we're just making a passing game coordinator. Because if they were interviewing guys for the offensive coordinator role, then it makes sense to consider Deuce. That said, maybe part of the reason why Graham Harrell and James Urban and some of these other guys took their name out of the hat is because they wanted the offensive coordinator title. They didn't just want to be called the passing game coordinator to leave the situations that they were in. So that's interesting to me from one aspect. The other thing is there were reports that Josh McCown was offered a coaching job. I want to know what that coaching job was or at least have some insight of yeah. what went into that process. Uh, you know, Mike Groh was able to bounce back really quickly, and he got a wide receivers gig with Frank Reich. I do kind of have some questions about that. Um, well, yeah, I think Doug has to answer for him lying to the media, basically. Yeah, um, essentially. Like, yeah. I don't know if he, how, he – I don't think that's going to be something he actually gives us a real answer to. I think he's going to acknowledge that he messed up or something. Um, probably what he said in the press release, but yeah, that's, I mean, that was just a bad look all around. Yeah. I mean, and you know, whether the decision was his overall or whatever, he shouldn't have said what he said. And I, I mean, I don't even think the question was very complicated. So no, for him are being, they coming back? And he said, yes. So. Yeah. Um, so again, that's, that's interesting to me, but yeah, I am looking forward to all the other stuff at the combine. Um, yeah, I was going to say, so who are, uh, I know you've watched some film, but who are some guys, I mean, we don't really get to actually watch them working out. I don't believe, but we don't, uh, who, who are some guys you're excited to hear about? Talk, talk to, talk about, like, who are some of the guys that you have your eye on? I'm so, guessing receiver is the main area. Yeah, so wide receiver has really been what I've been focused on pre-combine. Typically, I start film study in November, but I've got a one-year-old, so it's been a little <laughs> difficult to do that. And I've been sick pretty much every other day for the last, you know, six months. But um, I'm interested in the guys after C.D. Lamb, Jerry Judy, and Henry Ruggs. Um Jalen Rager from TCU is going to run really, really well. He's a guy that kind of reminds me of Santonio Holmes. He can be a really good possession receiver. He's got good speed. Um, I'm interested to see what he runs. Brandon Ayuk uh, I from uh, ASU. He's a guy that Daniel Jeremiah absolutely loves. He's got some really good return ability. Um, I don't know if he's a first-round wide receiver to me. It just kind of seems like he's a possession guy that has speed. Um, I'm interested to see how he does in, in the gauntlet drill T Higgins. I want to see how fast he runs because if he's as slow as he is on tape, 
he's really talented, but I'm just not into a jump ball guy at this point with the roster that you currently have. Gabe Davis and Antonio Gandy Golden are two uh, smaller school wide receivers uh, that I think will be available on day two that I've really, really liked watching. Uh, Gandy Golden has been compared to some, compared by some uh, to uh, Calvin Johnson as far as physical attributes. I don't know if I'd go that far, but he's definitely a big fish in a small pond at Liberty. I saw him play against Syracuse and Buffalo, and he killed the Orange. I mean, this kid has some really special physical tools. Uh, if they were to draft him, that's probably nights, good night for, for J.J. Gabe Davis is basically a good J.J. Arcega Whiteside. He's He uses his size well. He's big the problem with him is he's not a very quick twitch kind of receiver he also played exclusively on the left side at UCF so he needs to learn the position as we get lower in the draft a guy that has a connection to there are two guys that have a connection to Aaron Moorhead that I think would entice the Eagles as maybe like a double dip candidate on day three Courtney Davis from Texas A&M and then uh Kalija Lipscomb from Vanderbilt both are two guys that have some decent speed. They can be used in the slot. They can be used outside. Um, I think they'd be upgrades over, you know, the the Rob Davis and and um, Deontay Burnett types on the roster. I think they would play pretty well. Uh, the one guy on defense that really stood out to me, and I mentioned this on Twitter, uh, is Jordan Elliott from Missouri. This guy is is going to be a special player. He's probably going to be taken, from what I've seen, the projections, second or third round. He's a guy that kind of reminds me of Malik Jackson a little bit. There's some Timmy Jernigan to him, too. He's got a great motor, nice size, really good vision as a pass rusher. He's got good burst. I, I just really like him, and I think he'd be a really good third defensive tackle in that rotation and eventually take over for Malik Jackson. Yeah, um, I imagine, you know, next week is going to be, you know, where Twitter is like full of guys saying teams they met with, which doesn't actually mean all that much. But I imagine that there's going to be a lot of ride receiver talk, and Eagles fans are going to be very curious to see Hen- how Henry Ruggs performs because he's like, the guy this year yeah he like eagles fans he's like the eagles fans guy he's for sure hollywood brown this year here's my thing though okay a lot of people have said they have to get a wide receiver in the first round let me dispel that so just last year the eagles had to get a wide receiver in the first round and hollywood brown was available to for them He, he would have been there uh but they decided to trade up and draft andre dillard because they saw the way the tide was turning with Jason Peters. They they put it off for t- far too long. He fell. They liked Dillard. He's now the starting left tackle, probably. Um, I would not be shocked if somebody like Javon Kinlaw fell to maybe 16 and they were in love with him and they traded up for him. That Absolutely. Kid, the defensive tackle from South Carolina is phenomenal. He's a guy that could start right away. Like Malik Jackson wouldn't start another game for the Eagles after that. I mean, you'd still use him in a rotation, but like he's a guy who could be a really special player, especially with Malik and uh, Fletcher Cox approaching their 30s. Um, that's something to keep an eye on. I also think the cornerback group, once like the f- top three come off the board, there is a an astronomical drop-off in talent. Um, so, you know, they're not going to get that kid from Ohio state who I'm not even going to try to pronounce his name. Okuda. Yeah. Okuda. All right. Oh man. I got it on first try. Uh, <laughs> he's going top five. Um, and then I think you look at somebody like CJ Henderson, who I like, I think the talk about him not being f- very physical is fair. If you watch the Miami game, he literally dives at, at a runner, like he's a sack of potatoes. <laughs> like it's almost like like you know that you know that viral video where like all those guys are on on like the speedboat and then they all like kind of like just flounder and fall down. That's kind of that you know the turn down for what you know that okay. have you ever seen yeah. that video? Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. So the guys just fall uh, fall down. But um, Tony Pride from Notre Dame is an interesting target for day two. That I I keep an eye on. I'm not normally a huge fan of Notre Dame players, but um, on defense. But there you go. Um, 
yeah, I mean, like, this class is not... Oh, and then the other guy, Christian Fulton, um, I don't know how much of a scheme fit he's going to be. He plays a lot of press. He's a very physical corner from LSU. I think the Eagles would be interested in him, but I just think the sweet spot for him is probably the Cowboys just because they're probably going to lose Byron Jones. So after those guys, C.J. Henderson is a target possibly for the Raiders and the, and the Jaguars. So I'm interested to see what these day two corners have. I don't think the Eagles will press for a corner in the first round. So wide receiver or defensive lineman is probably where they're looking at. Um, Patrick Queen from LSU is the one linebacker that's probably in their projected range that I would be interested in the first round. I don't think Howie will touch him. Um, but they do also need to get a linebacker in this draft, whether they sign somebody or not. Yeah, that, I mean, that'd be pretty wild if they actually did pick the linebacker in the first round. But yeah, everything I've read about Patrick Queen with that watching him, he seems like a legit uh, sideline to sideline guy. Um, all right, before we, we'll do a podcast while we're out in Indy. We're going to both get out there on Monday. Howie and uh, Doug talk on Tuesday morning or Tuesday afternoon. Sorry. Right? Yes, Tuesday we've got to we've got to wait for them. Yes. Yeah. Um, before we go, though, I should say Connor Hughes of the Athletic uh, just did something on Alshon Jeffrey and the Jets possibly interesting in him. And in there, he reports that uh, the Eagles are looking to move Alshon Jeffrey. So <laughs> I'm sure teams are really listening to them. Yeah, I mean, uh, no comment. <laughs> I mean that's not, it's not surprising, but it is that's the first time I've actually seen that reported that they're trying to get rid of him. Um, all right, we can end on that note. Uh, maybe there'll be some more news for you guys by the time we get to our next podcast. Maybe we'll try and do that on Tuesday or Wednesday. Is my guess. Um, you got any last notes before we head out to Indy? I'm interested to see how the Eagles value the, the slot wide receiver position hmm. because you know we've talked a lot about. Um, or at least Eagles fans have talked a lot about Justin Jefferson. And he's a guy that I really, really like from LSU. The problem is, is he's almost exclusively used in the slot. If they really, really like this kid or uh, LaVisca Chenault from Colorado, both of those guys to me project as slot receivers at the NFL level. Are you going to spend another first round pick to replace Nelson Aguilar? That's an interesting question moving forward as we look at the draft as a whole. Yeah, I, I'm. If you think about, it, remember last year they they worked out a lot of slot guys. Yep, and they didn't draft any of them. <laughs> All right, uh, we'll end on that note. Uh, thanks for listening, guys. Make sure you sign up for Eagles Extra. Leave us some comments, write us some reviews, and uh, we'll start getting back into a good groove, of getting you some podcasts. All 